Welcome to the Brent Holland Show, folks. A serious show tonight. The Olympics in Munich, 1972. Palestinian fanatical terrorists breach a security fence with the sole intent of carrying out a kidnapping plot of innocent Israeli athletes. Now, they did this in order to make a huge splash on the global stage. This was their big chance for fame, and if it meant cold-blooded murder, well, then so be it. They had already received the blessing of the grandfather of terrorism himself, Yasser Arafat, who told them, may God protect you. The current PLA president, Mahmoud Abbas, thought it was a great idea, so he decided to finance the complete operation. The terrorists would end up murdering in cold blood 11 human beings, whose only guilt in this whole story is that they were born Jewish and they wanted to represent their own country at the global harmonious gathering of people we call the Olympics. Now folks, among those murdered was a young 33-year-old man. He was the wrestling coach Moisha or Moses Weinberg. Our guest tonight is his son Guri Weinberg. Now folks, you're going to recognize that good-looking guy next to me. He, you may also recognize him as an actor from films such as The Twilight Saga, Breaking Dawn. He was Stefan and the famous quote, we've been waiting a millennium for the Italian scum to be challenged, and obviously I didn't deliver that as well as he did. <laughs> he was also in Ad Adam Sandler Zohan. He was Aaron. And more importantly, he got a chance to play his own father, in Steven Spielberg's Munich, and that was about the 1972 murders of those same 11 Israeli athletes. Welcome to the show, my friend. Thank you for having me. Thank you, my friend. Heavy question right off the start. Let's go back now. I grew up without a dad myself. When was the first time you went to your mom and said, where's dad? Where's daddy? Well, I think, it, uh, I believe it was kindergarten. Um, it was when I went out and was with other kids and saw them with their parents is where I understood something was missing. And um, I went and asked her and um, she started telling me, but I couldn't, I was too young to really understand too much about it. So it was more of a general answer of, you know, he was murdered at the Olympics. and. As I got older, more towards the first grade is when I started really understanding what happened, but as much as a first grader can understand. You see kids with both parents there, whether it was the father or the mother that came to pick them up from kindergarten or, or school, the whole family was missing. More than anything, it was just very, very lonely. Privately, what did it do to your mom? Oh, it drove her insane. Um, you know, it just, um, it ruined her emotionally, psychologically, um, it just, it, it just, she, she's, till today, she, she's not over it. By the way, folks, uh, Yuri was born August 1st, 1972, happy birthday, by the way, Leo. He was only a month old when his dad was murdered, September 5th, 1972. Can we talk a little bit then about your investigation and how the German government was complicit in many areas of this? Yes, uh, well, in, in back in 2012 in the uh, London Olympics, when the information was brought out that a Nazi group have helped the, PL, the Black September PLO um, get weapons, um, uh, you know, fake IDs, places to stay, scout the uh, Olympic Village and uh, give them all that they needed to do, I, I, that, was, that was the thing that clicked, you know, my whole life when I went, something's not right here. And um, so I started looking up all the players involved, whether it was um, Avery Brundage, who was the president of the ICO back then, who had very, very close ties to not only Hitler, but the Nazi party, and it was a big Nazi supporter himself. Um, also, Juan Antonio Samaranch, who was a Nazi, uh, you know, uh, sympathizer, but a fascist himself um, back in Spain. Uh, in my um, op-ed, I put a picture of him uh, saluting the Nazi salute. The IOC for years have been trying to um, hide the fact of who Avery Brundage was, 
who Juan Antonio Samaranch was, and who their founders, you know, of the New Olympics were, and their ties to the Nazi Party, and um, and all all the Nazis and the police and the Secret Service, and also the government of uh, West Germany, because. I also found that it out that back then when it was East and West Germany, East Germany was more the Nazi party and West Germany was trying to get away from it. Only they had so many Nazis still in their ranks, even though they knew about it, um, they were trying to hide it. They were trying to go a different road, but the Nazis didn't want them to go a different road. So, yeah. There is evidence that they actually aided and abetted the Palestinian organization, too. Could you tell a little bit about that and Paul Dickhoff? Yes. Well, Paul Dickhoff was, uh, at that time, uh, until 1972, was the head of Interpol, and he was an SS member. And after World War II, um, he went through the ranks of the German police, uh, German Secret Service, and he brought a lot of SS members with him and Nazi soldiers with him all the way up to Interpol. And um, and there was uh, the Nazi groups in West Germany were also helping the PLO in the in the uh, 60s and 70s do all these terrorist attacks like hijack airplanes and all that. They they have very very close ties all the way back to Hajimin al Husseini, who was an Arab in Palestine, who was the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem who apparently is also a family member of Yasser Arafat as well. Hajimin al-Husseini, back in World War II, went to Hitler and said, I want to be a part of your movement. I don't want any more Jews coming to Palestine. We're trying to kill them where they're at already. And he created the first Muslim SS group, which killed tens of thousands in Bosnia and Yugoslavia. And after World War II, he ran away to Egypt, where other Nazis have ran away to hide. And that's where they had a connection regarding finances, weapons. That's where he introduced Yasser Arafat to Nazi paramilitary to train them how to do guerrilla fighting and get ammunition and, and, and the money as well for, for the uh, PLO. Hajimin al-Husseini was the uh, founder of Fatah. Yasser Arafat and many others like Abu Mazan were the founding members of the PLO. And they joined uh, forces in 1970 and just put it all under one umbrella. There's a lot of young folks listening right now um, that are big time fans of Twilight, probably big time fans of yours more than mine. (laughs) They don't know too much about that era because Yasser Arafat has passed away now. Can you tell us what that was like going through that, the 70s, the 80s? Well, I mean, it, it was very difficult because Yasser Arafat, you know, what a lot of people want to hide is he was really Egyptian. You know, uh, he wasn't a Palestinian. He was from Egypt. And um, he hated Jews, just like his uh, great uncle, uh, Hajimin al Husseini. And, um, you know, the PLO, what a lot of people don't understand is that the PLO was created in 1964. Uh, okay. Everybody likes to talk about the 1967 borders, and that's why they were created, but that's not the fact. And every time somebody brings that point up to me, I say, do you know when the PLO were created? And they they think it's 1967. And, um, you know, I said, no, the truth of the the matter is it was 1964. So what were they liberating then? And his uncle, Hajimin al-Husseini, was trying to kill Jews from the 1920s. Uh, by saying, just like today, what uh, Abu Mazan likes to say, that Jews are attacking the, 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 um, uh, over there at the Temple Mount, trying to, uh, trying to push away all the Arabs, which was not true. And there were all these attacks on Jews with knives, just like today, to, to kill. And they did. They, they killed uh, thousands of Jews back then. So that's what I try to explain to people, is that this has nothing to do with the 1967 borders. This has to do with they don't want Jews in that area, as you can see from, you know, all the Jews who were kicked out of Iraq or Libya or, you know, all the other Arab and Muslim countries. They did not want Jews there. I think it was almost 900,000 Jews that were kicked out of Arab countries and hundreds of thousands were killed even before they were able to get out. Um, so the difficult thing about that is that uh, it's gotten so muddled with the politics that people have forgotten what the real history is all about. That this is not about borders 
Um, this is not about uh, you know Jews hating Muslims. Uh, as a matter of fact, that's completely not true because so many Muslims have helped Jews after World War II to escape from Europe. So people don't understand the difference between Muslims and the different countries and cultures in the Muslim countries. And, it, and that's the most frustrating thing. They like to put everything under one umbrella. And it's a way more complicated than that. I agree with you completely. Folks, terrorists are nothing more than thugs who love to hide behind the Koran in the same sense that the KKK are nothing more than criminal thugs who like to hide behind the Bible. Let's keep going with this line of thought. When was the first time you experienced anti-Semitism? Can you tell the folks that are listening right now what it's like to be a Jew in 2016? It's very difficult to be a Jew. I mean, I, I, I remember when my grandmother and, and grandmothers of my friends in Israel that actually survived the Holocaust telling me the stories back then. And I, I just couldn't imagine what that was like. And now we're experiencing it all over again. You know that, never forget. Well, we all forgot. And I've been attacked many, many times for being a Jew. And, um, Can you tell us actually, one of those times? When we were suing the German government years ago, um, I called the, the German embassy um, to see what was going on. And the response I got back from a woman that answered the phone is, why don't you uh, 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 stop calling us? Uh, and I, if I remember it correctly, she said, you Jews only look for money. Um, you know, they, uh, this has nothing to do with Germany. There's been such a divide between Jews all over the world, thinking, no, that's Israel's problem, that's not our problem. Well, Israel didn't exist in World War II. Israel didn't exist back in the 18, 1600s, where Jews were just being slaughtered everywhere. You just keep going back and back and back to the Bible days of Jews just being slaughtered over and over and over again. But yeah, being Jewish today is not easy. It has also uh, hurt my acting career because, you know, when you're a Jew in, in Hollywood, you got to hide the fact that you're a Jew unless you look like those cartoons that anti-Semites always use to make fun of Jews, right? So if you don't look like that, don't use your Jewish name. And I have stayed stubborn about it because I believe that that is anti-Semitism by itself because... You know, Jews are from all over. You got your white Jews, you got your brown Jews, you got your black Jews, you got your Asian Jews, you got all kinds of Jews because we dispersed thousands of years ago, again, because we were slaughtered into different areas. So after all those thousands of years, of course, we've changed color, we've changed languages, we've changed all that. So Jews don't only look one way. And that is another part that of, of being hard, being Jewish, especially in Hollywood. How do you feel about Israel apartheid week every time it shows up on campuses? Well, it's ridiculous. I mean, you know, it's, uh, of course, it's a, it's a made up thing to, to get um, Israel again down, kick all the Jews out. Uh, there is a lot of people that are just don't know anything about Israel and they hear these slogans and these lies. And what I always tell people is don't believe just because somebody says something, don't believe it. Go, go look for yourself. Go study it yourself. Don't even believe me. Go out there and do your homework, not from blogs, from history books. I mean, really, really do your homework. The, the apartheid week, you know, I mean, look, there's been lies about Israel, you know, all these years. Like in 1975 at the UN when they started the Zionism equals uh, uh, racism, right? Racism. Well, well, the head of the, the UN back there was uh, Kurt Waldheim, right. who was an SS member. He was a Nazi. And they hid that from them. So he was the secretary, of, you know, the, the secretary general of the UN, helping the anti-Israel uh, countries go, go after Zionism as racism only 30 years after World War II. I mean, the audacity is incredible. And I ask those people who are so blindly following that apartheid thing with Israel, if you don't look at history, at facts yourself, history will judge you. So I always say to people, please don't believe anybody who just says slogans or lies. Just go study it yourself. 
It's very sexing and in vogue right now for a lot of campuses, a lot of uh, campus governments to adopt something called BDS. Many students listening right now may have heard of this boycott, divest, and sanctions. The argument being that I can criticize Israel, but I'm not an anti-Semite, I'm an anti-Zionist. Can you speak to that? Well, I mean, you know, you always catch them when they talk about the Jews. Notice how it always comes out. Even the founder of the BDS always says the Jews. They are always saying the Jews. It's not about Israel. It's a, Well, it is about Israel because they don't want it to exist. People don't talk about that Israel is 20% Arab, whether it's Christian or Muslim. They're free to do whatever they want, vote. Uh, go to school. I mean, literally all equal rights. Um, Israel is equal rights with uh, with the, the gay community. Yes. Uh, place in the Middle East for a gay pride parade. They have a huge gay pride month that people from all over the world come and, and celebrate. Of course, being anti-Zionism is anti-Jews uh, uh, because Zionism is all about making sure that Jews have a country where they're safe because for thousands of years Jews have not been safe anywhere. That's all Zionism is about. I want to ask you, I want to go back to your dad now. Now you had the glorious opportunity to work with Steven Spielberg, but there was a caveat to it. You were going to have to play your dad who was murdered. How did you prepare for that as an actor, as a human uh, being, as a son, all those aspects of it? Whenever somebody asks me that question, I say, um, I don't really know because the whole filming part of it was almost like walking through a dream. I knew I was on the set. I knew I had to reenact the last uh, moments of my father's life. Um, and all I was trying to say to myself is, you're an actor, you're a pro, do it. But at the same time, inside my brain, it was just swirling because... It, here's what's so funny about it. The reason why I decided to do it is because all my life I wanted to know what my dad went through. Because when I was a little kid, I was a little angry at my dad going, why did he have to be such a fighter? Why did he have to be such a hero? Maybe he, if he would have just shut up and did what they did, he would still be alive. Well, for the first time in my life, I understood why he couldn't do it. He understood and they understood that their, their only way to stay alive was to fight back because also you know a few years ago um, the, the, the German government has released more paper that have shown that um, the athletes were beaten uh, they had broken bones this was before they were murdered they were badly abused um, uh, my father when uh, when they caught him he was first shot between the cheeks and then they had him lead them to the other team. And when one of his guys uh, ran, he grabbed uh, one of the guns, tried to knock him down, and he was shot in the chest and the head. But Yosef Romano, who tried to fight back, was shot quite a few times. And his body was put in the middle of all the athletes who were tied and gagged um, so they can watch him die very, very slowly. And then after, they, they don't know whether it was right before he died or right after he died, they, they castrated him. Um, it was so vicious. And they kept saying, oh, we didn't go there to kill anyone. We were just there to liberate our, our, our members from jail. And it, well, if that's the case, why the brutality? Why did these athletes have broken bones and, and all these bruises beat up so badly before they were murdered? So when I was on the set, it was just cathartic to understand finally and be at one with the fact that my father had no other choice but to do what he did and fight. Can you tell what happened to the terrorists that were taken captive afterwards? They were put in jail, they were going to go up to court, but all of a sudden just happens that another Lufthansa flight was hijacked, and they demanded that they would be taken out. They were released right away, because they said that the plane was full of women, children, and men. Years later, it was found out that that wasn't the case. It was about a handful of men who were German police officers. They staged the whole thing to release the terrorist out of jail. And that's what happened. So the terrorists, of course, 
ran to all over Europe, to the Middle East. They, they, they of course, well, of course, uh, they, they sent them to Libya, which they had uh, a hero's welcome and a big celebration on their behalf. Can we talk a little bit about Israel's response under Golda Meir and the reason for the movie Munich? Yes. Uh, well, Golda Meir at that point said, enough is enough. We're not going to take this. Also, she saw it as a deterrence to stop terrorists, saying, if you do this, we will come after you. And she sent them Assad. They managed to assassinate most of them, which is not only the terrorists themselves that killed the 11 athletes, it was also the financiers and the, the people that helped with logistics as well. How do you feel about Steven Spielberg's Munich? I'm not talking about your part, but the message it sends at the end with the Twin Towers in the background. Well... I'm putting you on the spot. If you don't want no, to answer that, I don't want to... No, 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 that's fine. Um, the, the whole thing with the Twin Towers is, is that Munich, the, the Munich massacre was the first world stage terrorism. But again, when it comes to Jews, people are like, oh, that's okay. But it never, ever ends with the Jews. It always starts with the Jews, just like World War II. Everybody just put a blind eye, and then everybody else started suffering and went, why, why us? I thought we were, you were just going after the Jews. Well, when the 1972 Olympic massacre happened, everybody said that again. And they allowed terrorism to rise because terrorists went, aha, if I do this on the world stage, anything big that will scare people, I will get what I want. And if I yell enough that this is for a political reason, they will let me go. Yeah. And yeah. the whole world allowed that to happen because they thought it was just Israel and the Jews. But that's never the case. As Hitler taught us, as history taught us, when one group is being targeted, you can be assured that the rest will be as well. A lot of people make the argument, I think wrongfully, saying that if there was peace between Palestine and Israel, all terrorism would stop. Yeah, that, that, that'll never happen. That's not the fact. If that's the case, then what's ISIS for? What's Al-Qaeda for? Why are they killing each other? Why are they bombing in Europe when Europe has helped them so much, giving them a lot of money? and they're giving them a lot of cover when it comes to uh, politics, why are they going after them? Now the Palestinians are even suing the England, England for the Belfort, uh, you know, accord. It, look, if that was the case, it wouldn't kill each other. And, I, I, and that's, I, I, I don't have to go further than that. Why are they killing each other? So, you know. How do you live day to day? Now knowing your family history, I'm not going to ask you a cliche if you found closure by playing your father, um, because I've never found closure for the death of my father either. I find ways of living with it day by day. Is it much the same way for you? Very much the same way. I found, like I said earlier, I found closure more of my personal anger with my father of why he had to fight. That was the closure I found for myself. Uh, of course, I can't find closure with it because um, all the players didn't take responsibility. The whole story hasn't come out yet. The German government is still hiding all the information. IOC is still fighting us and, and fighting us very, very dirty um, and to hide their, their hand in it and their past with the Nazi party and their support for the Nazi party. So no, it's very difficult to find closure. And just like you, I just every day try to find a way to live with it, understand it, and keep fighting to try to get closure. You mentioned the IOC, and I have to bring this up. Could you mention Alex Gilladi and that whole scenario that took place? I'd be happy to say the quote, if, unless you want to. Uh, no, uh, I mean, if I can say the quote, I, I, that's back in the uh, Atlanta Olympics, I believe it was 1986, Alex Gilladi called us, uh, all the families were invited, and we were all thinking, hey, you know, this is good news, maybe there's going to be a, a moment of silence before the opening ceremony. He very much told us that there, it's not going to be that, and so, of course, we all got angry, and I believe it was Anki who said, why not? I'm not understanding why not. And he said, well, because if we did that, we would have to put uh, the Palestinians that, that died there. and. It, my mom said, wait a minute, are you talking about the terrorists? And he's like, well, Palestinians died there too. And I, it, 
to me, things started moving in a slow motion when Ilana Romano, because she, she put out the scream and she started crying and she started yelling at him, pounding on the table. She goes, do you know what they did to my husband, Alex? They, they shot him, they left him there to die slowly, then they castrated him and shoved it in his mouth. And you're, you're telling me that those people should be um, on that list as well, the terrorists? And I was just in shock because that was the first time I've ever heard that. I never knew that part. And apparently, Anki and Ilana got that information years ago and kept it under wraps because the kids always are the last ones to always know. And I just, I was just in shock. I, 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 I didn't know what to do with myself for like a few years after that. And that's why when the London Olympics came along and they still wouldn't do it, I just said the hell with it. And I wrote the story of what happened and said, this is what they want to do. They, they see the, the athletes and the murderers as the same because the athletes are Jews. And Alex Giladi, even though he's a Jew and an Israeli, he's uh, all about the money because I, the IOC is a huge corporation. You know, they're worth more than $50 billion in cash because they don't pay taxes, second only to Apple. And, oh yeah, second only to Apple. And they, uh, they are protected from any lawsuits. They don't pay taxes in Switzerland Bank. And uh, they get a lot of kickback and a lot of, it's a lot of corruption there. So the last thing they want to do, because if they, if they do give the moment of silence, that means that they are admitting and they have to admit their past and they're part of it. And that is the last thing they want to do. Have you been able to look at pictures of your own father? Yes, I, absolutely. I look at him all the time and, uh, you know, um, Pictures wish I could. Pictures that day when they threw him out on the street? No, no. I was never, I was always shielded from that. I saw uh, the, some of the other pictures from the helicopters, but that's as much as I could go. I would rather not see that, yeah. Uh, completely understood. Completely understood. If you were to meet your dad right now, what would you say to him? Um, wish you were there, wish it didn't happen, wish, uh, um, you, you raised me, huh? Would you hug him? Oh, I, I, that, that would be the first thing I would do. I, I think I would say everything I just said while I was still hugging him. Um, you know, somebody asked me one time in another interview, uh, what, what would you do after you passed away? And. And God, uh, you know, and God asks you what you wanted, and I, I would say I want to meet my father. That's the first thing I want to do. I want to know the man that, um, you know, that I've never known, and I've heard so many, so many wonderful stories about. And uh, um, so, yeah, that would, that would yeah, hug him. I, I, I wouldn't let him go. Do you visit his grave often? Uh, not as often uh, as I want to, uh, being all the way over here in his grave is in Israel. Sometimes it's difficult for me to go. Would you do me a favor the next time you do? Would you put a rock on his grave for me? I would be more than happy to, yes. Thank you very much. Final question. It's a question I ask virtually every guest that comes on the show. You're literally talking to every single Canadian student in a, in a university college community radio right across Canada, also on the internet, therefore international as well, and a lot of um, stations carry it in the United States as well, Canadian TV. What would you say to the students? I say you go to school not only to learn facts, but you go to school to learn how to do research. Because doing research and finding the truth out for yourself is what surviving this world is all about. And not allowing the bad things of, of the past repeat itself. So all I say to the students, whatever it is you study, whatever it is you believe in, always verify for yourself. That is part of your curriculum, is to verify information and find out for yourself and that is the most important thing because as you go through life you're going to have to do that in all so sorts of circumstances and that is the most important thing about school all right that's perfect www.brenthollandshow.com folks i'm brent holland we'll see you next time